Hi everyone, we are back together and today I'm making a video for my students in the second year food chemistry class and we've been talking about problem solving. You're likely seeing I'm wearing a headset today and that's part of my problem solving in that a few people have mentioned that while they're really enjoying the videos, they are finding that the sound quality is a little bit, um, a, a little bit, uh, I want to say opportunity for improvement, <laughs> a little less uh, uh, in terms of the quality that it could be. And it just happens that my uh, my daughter is a gamer and she said, well, you should try out my headset to see how you like it, to see if it creates a better video quality for your students. So I'm doing that problem solving today and seeing how it works. But we are going to talk about problem solving and uh, work through some different um mental models of how we go about teaching and learning problem solving because again when we understand how and why we are doing different processes it allows us to better assimilate and really rationalize the purpose behind what we're doing and learning so i'm going to jump over to the powerpoint and we'll join you there so at the end of this video you will be able to discuss Fauché and Kirkley's concept for learning problem solving and again problem solving is something that we can learn and it's something we can practice and something that we can teach and so we're going to work through a really strong academic model that's been developed and used quite widely in um, teaching problem solving across a variety of disciplines and we'll use some context uh, relating it to food chemistry and food science. We'll also reflect on our own approaches to solving problems and creating opportunities when problems arise. And um, as I mentioned, oftentimes within organizations, you'll have certain people jump in and say, hey, I see a problem. I'd like to get this fixed. Let's find ways of getting things fixed. You likely have worked in organizations, too, where you have people who say, you know what, I see a problem. Um, to use a, a bit of a silly line, uh, they'll often say, not my circus, not my monkeys, but uh, innovators and leaders tend to be people who say, wait a second, I see a problem within this organization. I'm going to go about getting it fixed. And that's a really important uh, behavior and a really important employability skill. So problem solving can be a food science related skill. It can be a general employability skill as well. But relating it to food science, what's really important about problem solving is that you're taking accumulated knowledge and skills and you are starting to use it in ways that are um, not those, I want to say, convergent ways that we're expecting, but we're starting to use them in in unexpected and divergent ways. And um, I have a different video where we talk about uh, the difference between convergent versus divergent um, uh, thinking processes, but convergence is just where there's one set way of doing things and divergence is where there's many different ways. Problem solving relies a lot on that many different ways, especially for many of what we call ill-defined problems. Oftentimes there is not one answer, there are many answers. And so from a teaching and learning perspective, I can't just uh, put a multiple choice quiz out there for problem solving. I have to be open minded as a teacher to be able to mark and evaluate uh, different problems that students might be uh, resolving as part of assignments and assessments. So the thing is, uh, problem solving is defined by a lot of the accumulated knowledge and skill, and that's where we have to go about learning some foundational knowledge to be able to then go and apply it to problem solving. Those of you who are in my chemistry class know that we are in the we're in the kitchen in the front end because we're going to be thinking about problem solving from a pedagogical perspective on the front end using skills that we know and we're going to introduce little bits of uh, food science and food chemistry as we go along. And then as we go to the second half of the semester, we are going to go to the chemistry lab and apply more, if I can use the term, ill-defined concepts and increase the complexity of our problem solving. We're going to uh, add more complexity by adding more chemical uh, analysis techniques 
and adding more knowledge of structure and function of, of uh, macronutrients in foods so that we can solve even more complex problems. So that's, as, as Fauché and Kirkley call them, the ill-defined or ill-structured problems that are common in a lot of problem-solving scenarios. So problem-solving in history, the problem-solving has been taught for many, many uh, centuries, if possibly even millennia. The ancient Greeks used to use riddles and games in their in their philosophy classes as a way of teaching problem solving. But we know now uh, with a lot of modern pedagogy that problem solving is something that we can learn as a life skill and it's a behavior. I mentioned before, oftentimes leaders in organizations are the problem solvers. Uh, the innovators are the problem solvers most definitely. And it's a behavioral thing. You can, you can ignore problems when you see them or you can go in and tackle them head on and say, you know what, I can use a good, amount of appropriate knowledge and skill and values to be able to solve these problems. So behavior has to be solutions oriented. You want to go in and not just be critical and say, I see problems, blah, 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 and I'm just going to grumble about them, but that you're also saying, I see a problem and I can see a solution as well, and to be able to offer some of those solutions. And again, as I mentioned before, that behavior is defined by previous knowledge and previous competency. And so for you as a student, your capability of solving problems is going to be better focused on those those well-defined problems initially. But as you mature and as you as you gain more experience, you'll be able to uh, work on many of those ill-defined problems that uh, that are mentioned uh, in Fauché and Kirkley's paper quite frequently. So again, it's. It's really about taking all the different information that's available to you and starting to organize it into a meaningful pattern. Well, what? how do they describe it in Fauché and Kirkley? They talk about how the problem solver needs to first be able to describe the problem. And so we need to be able to think of what is going on. And uh, those of you who were in the chemistry class, we were talking about French fries and we were able to describe what we were seeing with the French fries and how can we go about making changes so we were describing what is the problem. So perhaps it was the French fries were too brown. Well, what causes browning in foods? We are now researching solutions. We were thinking about, well, browning is occurring because of caramelization, because of Miller browning, maybe because of enzymatic browning. We know about some of the different chemical mechanisms that are going on in the product by researching the solutions. Then we think about how can we apply? How could we knock back those enzymes? How could we modify the amount of caramelization or maillard that's going on. And we then needed to measure the outcome in either a qualitative or quantitative way so that we knew if we were being successful or not. So we're describing the problem, we're researching it, we're applying solutions, and we're measuring the outcome. That's really the foundation of problem solving. And the more we think about it from a deliberate perspective, we can figure out where are we in the process and where do we need to apply more action to be able to get to the outcome that we want. Now we mentioned about iteration as well and Fauché and Kirkley also talk us about iteration is that is that problem solving often isn't a once and you're done sort of scenario. It often is a situation where you're doing that cycle that describe, research, apply and measure multiple times until you're able to come up with the best conclusion possible. It, uh, science and problem solving is not a once and done scenario. If it was, we'd, we'd be in a pretty good world. Um, we need people who have perseverance and persistence to be able to go and repeat and repeat and repeat until you get to the outcome that you want. Now that said, the more knowledge you have, the more efficiently you're going to be able to iterate. And so that's where that foundational learning is really, really critical. Now, something that's important is that you have different aspects to problem solving when it comes to how you're processing knowledge. There's declar declarative or declaring uh, parts of it, and there are procedural parts of it, in that you have declarative knowledge. Again, this comes from Fauché and Kirkley, that in certain cases, you have a lot of different facts. You have a lot of different uh, those facts are the what part of problem solving. What is the problem? The concepts, that's where you have how elements. And then you have principles. Why is this occurring? And 
I think um, many of you have seen the video that I uh, made about uh, Bloom's taxonomy, where we talk about the different uh, the different uh, levels or hierarchies of learning. That facts are important, but we need to be able to synthesize it into principles. Why is this occurring? And um, those of you who are in the innovation program know that we walk around and ask, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Go figure it out. We have to be able to find those knowledge resources that help us learn facts, but also transition it into that why piece. And then, of course, we've got procedural knowledge. That's where we're looking at, the, at how you can define how things are done. Are they well-defined? Are they undefined? Or are they completely unpredictable? And in problem solving, we often have things, we often have problems that are very well-defined. We, we were talking about those french fries and we said, so we blanched these french fries. How long do we need to cook them? We, that was somewhat undefined, but it was, it was pretty predictable. I said, get yourself a timer and figure out, set that timer and decide when to pull the french fries when you think they're, they're done. Well, how do you know when they're done? Well, that's, that's one of those undefined, but it's not unpredictable. We know it's just going to be drop those french fries into the fryer and fry them until you think they're done. That doneness would be color, that doneness could be texture, that doneness could be, um, are they burnt? But it was, it, I didn't define it and say, drop those french fries in for four minutes. I gave a bit of procedural knowledge, but then un, left certain things undefined. But we left, and uh, nothing was, I, I want to say unpredictable. The, the french fries didn't blow up or the french fries didn't turn into, into donuts when we dropped them into the deep fryer. We had a lot of different things in terms of procedural knowledge that allowed us to uh, facilitate that project. Now, what's interesting, when we overlay these two different aspects of what we know in terms of the knowledge taxonomy and that ability to apply it, this is actually not from the Foshing and Kirkley paper. This is actually uh, what we call the rigor relevance framework. And this is where we are thinking about if we have certain basic knowledge, can we apply it in predictable ways? Can we apply it in unpredictable ways? And depending on how, uh, within Bloom's taxonomy, how high um, a taxonomy of knowledge do we have allows us to be able to problem solve in more complex ways. And so we do have those well-structured problems where in this, I want to say, a very, con very few or convergent number of solutions that are possible. And then we start to build out the level of complexity. I talked about this in the chemistry class that we're going to start with, with problems in the kitchen be in that our students have taken lots of culinary classes and they know how to cook. So they know that foods are going to function in a very certain way, but I'm going to give more, more open-endedness so that the problems become more ill-structured and that's going to challenge those problem-solving mindsets to be able to go in and iterate and go in and find the knowledge resources and quickly uh, evaluate those knowledge resources for quality to be able to uh, come up with solutions to those ill-structured problems. So how do we teach problem-solving? Well, uh, we need to have a combination of knowledge and procedures, and we need to combine those appropriately. And so in this class, in the chemistry class that I'm teaching right now, a lot of the knowledge, a lot of that convergent content, I'm going to be presenting in videos, and then we're going to be going into the classroom, into the laboratory, and using procedures in slightly undefined ways. And so if you're one of the students in the chemistry class, I'm going to encourage you to make sure you you have reviewed the content beforehand. It's all posted for the most part for the entire semester. Review it beforehand because it's going to be helpful as you go about those procedures. Something else that's important to use real world context when doing problem solving. Don't, as a t if you're a teacher, if you are a, a leader in a community, maybe you're a parent and working with children, um, maybe you're a supervisor working with a team of uh, uh, general labor workers, if you need to have problem solving, you need to give the right context. And so in the chemistry class, I'm going to be doing lots of different problems that relate to things that I have seen in 
different employment situations. Some of them are problems that I worked on, um, massaged a bit, of course, but uh, problems that I worked on with different industry clients in the past that um, are good representation of the problem solving skills that you might use in a chemistry or uh, quality assurance laboratory scenario. You want to use deductive teaching for knowledge and skill acquisition and inductive teaching for problem solving and transference. Now, what does this mean? This is a lot of pedagogical terms, but deductive teaching is where you've got a lot more the teachers up there telling you this is the way it is. That's how knowledge is transferred. And so that comes from reading textbooks. It comes from reading papers. It comes from listening to authoritative resources. Um, in some cases, it's going to be coming from the industry or from research papers. And that's where you're getting that convergent knowledge. Inductive teaching is where you're giving a lot more open-endedness. And in chemistry, you've uh, many of the students at Niagara College took chemistry in a previous semester with uh, Dr. Sunan Wang. She would have used a lot more deductive teaching where she comes in and says, here's your method, please follow the method. And you're learning other, other skills like how to pipette, how to prepare solutions, how to titrate, how to use spectrophotometer and so on. In this class, we're using a lot more inductive teaching where I'm saying, hmm, I know you know how to pipette. I know you know how to make solutions. I know you know how to uh, research things. I'm going to give you some different problems and I want you to use the tools that I know you should have and be able to use them in an inductive way to see if you can solve a problem. And I give a lot more open-endedness because it is that inductive teaching. And that allows for problem solving and transference, that you are able to take your skills in problem solving and turn it into um, productivity and opportunity for your company. Something else that I talk about is that errors are opportunities for learning and they are not penalties. And in my own classes, and I realize this is not how most teachers teach, but in my own classes, I use the opportunity for feedback for you to go and change things and improve. And so for the most part, I do let students go back into their assignments. And especially when they're open-ended and problem-solving oriented, if there was a big error, um, I let people go in and fix it. Because again, problem solving oftentimes is very open-ended and it's very difficult to just go and copy and plagiarize someone. So that works in the way that I'm teaching. It doesn't work for everyone. And I realize I'm unique in that way, but errors are opportunities for learning when we're thinking about problem solving. And they shouldn't be considered penalties. They should be, especially in the classroom setting, that opportunity to improve oneself and to keep growing with that growth mindset that's necessary for problem solving. Last but not least, good problem solving needs access to diverse resources. And so it could be declarative knowledge, but other learning tools and resources are important. We talked in class about how the use of Picking up the phone and knowing who some of those experts are is a really important skill. Um, maybe it's not the phone, maybe it's email, or maybe it's connecting via LinkedIn. But um, long story short, there are all sorts of different resources. And in many cases, it is good to have it as memorized knowledge. And in other cases, it's really good to practice using the research tools and the associative uh, looking stuff up and calling people and finding knowledge resources online when it's the right context that's the right thing to do from a teaching and learning perspective and as such that's why I rely on that quite heavily um, again that's very different from some of your other teachers but that's okay problem solving is a very different skill set and many of your other teachers are focused on those knowledge acquisition and that deductive teaching piece so that we can go into these courses of problem solving and be really effective. It works all together and it's a really important ecosystem in learning. So again, we have a lot of fun with problem solving. Oh, it's Marshall Gans. I love Marshall Gans. He is a really inspired leader and this is one of my favorite quotes. Challenge the status quo. It takes commitment, courage, imagination of bubble, a dedication to learning. And honestly, um, I know I speak a lot more about Marshall Gans in third year because he talks about leadership and organizational strategy and building narratives. But I like to 
end many of my different videos with inspirational quotes. And I really like to think of so many of the different leaders who are out there um, encouraging us to continue learning and continue applying all sorts of different approaches to problem solving. Uh, many of the students in my chemistry class say, this is such a playful and fun class. And I'm like, because problem solving takes courage and imagination. And um, it's not just that acquisition of knowledge. It's now application of that knowledge in really useful and meaningful ways. And so continue being dedicated to your learning. And I love hearing your questions and I love communicating with you about all of these different ideas. So take care and we'll talk to you again real soon.